okay? I think that will be just fine. That'll leave, uh, we've been running a little bit late in general today, so that'll leave at least 10 minutes at the end, I think, for, for questions. Um, okay, so for the for it. yes, so it should be, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I put my clock here, I try to, to be in time. And uh, so I'll start right away. Thank you very much for inviting me and uh, uh, of course, uh, the organizer uh, and uh, uh, it was very kind and gave me a lot of work, but it's very nice and I'm very pleased to be here. Now, the, the topic, um, uh, I thought the topic of, of, of the conference, of the seminar was comparing uh, European and American philosophical tradition. That was one of the topics. <laughs> Yes. Problem? We uh, need to remind everyone if you are not currently speaking or presenting to mute your microphone to make room. And Francois Xavier, you might have capacity to mute people who are not muting. There we go. Thank you. Go continue, Romain. Go ahead. Thank you very much. So, uh, so basically, my topic will be um, comparison of philosophical tradition between France and America. That will be my topic. Uh, I think there are two reasons why I've been invited by good friends, uh, but there are reasons apart from being friends. I think the first one is that I published recently a book uh, dealing with Tocqueville and management. So, and Tocqueville, of course, is, a, is an exemplar of the way of uh, comparing fr uh, Europe and France and the States. So this is, uh, so there is a Tocquevillian approach to this comparison, and I will of course, uh, lean on it. That's a, one thing. But there is an, a second reason why uh, it's topical that I would be uh, dealing with this topic. It, it is because I'm a professor of marketing. And I'm not a philosopher. I'm a professor of marketing. And um, it, it's, uh, it, the, first, there is strong difference of attitude in France and the States toward marketing, at least when I started to teach and when I came to the States to learn about mar how to teach marketing, there, there, there was a transfer from America to Europe. So already you have this. And, um, and but the, the, the other reason is that I found that marketing was the topic in management, which was the closest to philosophy. And uh, that may, come as a surprise. But actually, um, who are the sophists? Uh, I, I wrote a book long ago, the, precisely thinking about that, which argument was that marketing was nothing else than a modern bureaucratic form of sophistry or of sophism. So, but being a sophist or being dealing with sophistry, uh, means you are the enemy of philosophy, of course. And that's why people are surprised that somebody dealing with marketing would come to deal with philosophy. But to be the best enemy of philosophy, the, the, the enemy that Plato liked to, to talk with and that Aristotle liked to throw out of the city um, is not to be indifferent to philosophy. In a way, marketing is an intimate enemy uh, to, to philosophy and consequently, there is a link between both. And so it's maybe less surprising that somebody who is connected so intimately with philosophy as a manager uh, would, um, would be here to talk about, about philosophy. Of course, it's shocking, but that's, you know, that's, that's life. So, the, uh, so that's, uh, that's the, the, the reason why I'm here. Now, the, how I'm going to go about, I will try in the time, which, because it's a huge topic, and part of it is new, to, uh, uh, is new and is just a program of research it's, you know, in the last part, especially. So uh, there are four, so four parts. I put some colors so that you'll be able to follow where I am in my topic. Uh, there will be a line uh, on the bottom of the screen with, with the various colors uh, along the way. So the first topic will be uh, Tocqueville. Tocqueville on philosophy and Tocqueville on administration. And in both cases, he deals with it explicitly, theoretically. And in both cases, he says they are 
huge threats to democracy. There is a huge threat to democracy, which is linked with the destiny of philosophy in the exchange between America and Europe. And also, with, there is some problem with administration too. Once we see the threats to democracy, we are going to look at, uh, to, to, to think about Marie Douglas, uh, the British anthropologist, to get some interpretation of what does it mean? What, are the, what is the nature of this threat and uh, to democracy? Once we have done that, and along what Marie Douglas herself said that we should do, we are going to develop a comparative approach to the study of this threat to democracy. And this comparative approach will allow us in the last part to expose rapidly uh, the French uh, history of, of philosophy, of philosophical um, evolution of philosophy, and after the, the American uh, evolution of philosophy and the way in which they imply exchanges between both and between Europe and America. So first, Tocqueville, Deal with um, deal with both with administration and philosophy, and with exactly the same pattern in both cases. There are four points. First, there is a difference between France uh, or Europe and the States, which is which manifests itself by an absence, something that you don't find in America and that you are supposed to find when you come from Europe and from France, especially. This absence is only apparent. Behind this appearance lies an invisible common principle. Then he says the presence of this common principle is revealed through a dynamic process of exchange and of development. And finally, the evolution of this process to suggest a potential threat of radical uncertainty on democracy. So I, let's, let's see first the case of philosophy. I will go fast. There, of course, the, the, the language of, of Tocqueville is beautiful. So you wish to have long sentences. I will just, of course, use a few words, otherwise it won't be impossible. And uh, so first, a difference which manifests itself by an absence. There is not, I think, a single country in civilized world where less attention is paid to philosophy. America is one of the country in which Descartes is studied least. So that's the absence. There is no study uh, of Descartes, of those, not now. But that's what he said in, the, in, in, 18, in 1840. But this absence is only apparent because behind this appearance lies a common invisible principle. And he says, of course, Descartes is not studied, but he, his precepts are respected most. So you see the contradiction. On one side, you don't study them. On the other side, you are extremely Cartesian in the way you behave. Because it is impossible to eliminate dogmatic belief. And that is a central idea. You need dogmatic belief. Without them, it is unlikely that a substantial number of people would ever unite in a common belief. Then the presence of this common belief of this principle is revealed through a dynamic process of exchange and of development. And here you have this wonderful sentence saying, the situation of the American is entirely exceptional. This is American exceptionalism. Their Puritan origin, their commercial habits, the very contrary that inhabits, the proximity with Europe, which allows them not to study these things without lapsing into barbarism. I think this is a Key, key sentence. It is because the Americans are linked to Europe that they can afford not to study Descartes because they're going to import all this Descartes science and whatever speculation. And, and given the import, they have this knowledge, otherwise they would be barbarian. Thus, if they can avoid devoting too much attention to these dogmatic ideas, it is because they import them from Europe. Finally, the evolution of this process uh, of radical uncertainty. And this is an incredible sentence you find. If a democratic social sta state and democratic institutions were ever to prevail throughout the world, the light that illuminates the mind of man would gradually go dim 
and human beings would sink back into darkness. So it says in a way that democracy is required, uh, uh, that democracy destroys in a way the link to, to the enlightenment, which requires some, some degree of aristocracy, some degree of, um, the, of the possibility of uh, absence of utilitarianism in a way, which, which is required for this type of knowledge. If, if there is this evolution of democracy all over the place, paradoxically, the whole world would be in darkness. And, and the, the end of the sentence is absolutely dramatic and beautiful. If that is clear, uh, it says the same thing about administration, exactly the same thing. A, a difference which manifests itself by its absence. What most strikes the European who travels through the United States is the absence of what we would call government and administration. No, no administration. But of course, it's only apparent. Why? Because behind the appearance lie an invisible principle. Yeah, and that's what he says. Yet just as all people in order to express their thoughts must have recourse to certain grammatical form intrinsic to human language, so too must all society in order to exist, subject themselves to a certain measure of authority or else lapse in anarchy. That authority may be distributed in a variety of ways, but it must always exist somewhere. So again, that's wonderful analogy between administration if for society was grammar is for language. And so you cannot have a society with administration. So if you think they are not as administration, it's just because you have not looked at it properly. But this presence of this common principle is revealed through a dynamic process of exchange. He says, in America, society seems to lead from day to day, like an army in the field. Yet surely the art of administration is a science. For people who learn it, that's cool. And the science, in order to progress, need to accumulate discoveries generation after generation. Strangely enough, he speaks about the science of administration in 1840 and the real need for it. An evolution which suggests the need to import administrative knowledge to avoid future disorder because the non-democratic countries have administration. Democracy carried to its ultimate extreme is therefore inimical to progress in the art of government. In this respect, it is better suited to a people whose administrative education is already complete than to one that is still a novice in affairs of state. Now, uh, in, in um, thus he has one prediction and one prophecy. The prediction is that there will be the development of a science of administration in the United States. And this prediction took place and can be represented and I will not develop it too much because I want to, it's, it goes not much time, there isn't much time, but in uh, 1887 uh, in the Political Science Quarterly, Woodward Wilson writes what is probably the first article on the science of administration called the study of administration. And uh, it's a very funny one where he says exactly what Tocqueville says. We, we cannot learn administration for our, from ourselves because we don't know. We have to go to people, let's say Europe, who, who knows it. Of course, they are not democracy. And this is a problem. And you may object that France and Germany are not democracy. Yes. Um, but he says the problems are the same, whether you are of administration, they are similar, whether democratic or not democratic. And he said, if you don't have to be frightened of borrowing methods from non-democratic countries. And he has this sentence, which is, we borrowed rice, where we do not eat them with chopstick. Which is a, a nice way of saying. Now, this is, uh, this is a, the, the, the forecast, the, the prediction. But there is a, 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 there is a very uh, important prophecy, half prophecy. It doesn't prophesy it completely, but nearly so. With respect to the development of enterprise, he articulates, if not a prophecy, at least warning relative to the way in which the development of large enterprise may become a threat to democracy principles. As long as enterprise remains small societies within the large societies or society at large, the relations of subordination can be regulated by contract. Uh, hierarchical subordination lasting only as long as agreed in the contract, which links the master and the servant. However, 
Tocqueville hint to the possibility that the development of large enterprise, applying the principle of division of labor and economy of scale, and he says it, it's chapter 20 of, I think, the, the, of the second volume and so on, you know, one of the chapter 20, it's an incredible chapter. It, leads, it may lead to the return of aristocracy under the guise of what he calls industrial aristocracy. And, and it's a threat to democracy. And the sentence, I want to quote it completely, says, friends of democracy must keep an anxious eye peeled in this direction at all times. For if permanent inequalities of condition of an aristocracy are ever to appear in the world, it is safe to predict that this is the gate by which they will enter. Now this, so this is what I had to say about Tocqueville in the comparison. Now, um, Let's say I'm sorry I didn't uh, I didn't shift the the the, the but it's that hopefully you followed what I said. Uh, this is also now I want to go to Marie Douglas and Marie Douglas' interpretation of these threats to democracy in an article called Dealing with Uncertainty, published in 2001, and that you can find easily on the net. So the first thing is what is the meaning of dogmatic idea? And the, she says the presence of dogmatic ideas are associated by Tocqueville to the name of Descartes. And once again, so you see Descartes, of course, eh? which is studied in, in Europe, but not in the States, but it's Descartes, which is the dogmatic idea, which, you, which is required, he is associated with that. What characterizes Descartes' method is the search for certainty. So Marie de Glas writes, certainty is not a mood, or a feeling, it is an institution. This is my thesis. Certainty is only possible because doubt is blocked institutionally. Most individual decisions about risk are taken under the pressure from institution. Then she says, the need for certainty, why do we need certainty? The, the, there is a need first, uh, not why, but first, she says the most fundamental idea which upholds the possibility of society more fundamental even than the idea of God, is the idea that there can be certain knowledge. And this turned out to be extraordinarily robust, passionately defended by law and taboo in ancient and modern civilization. But why do we need uh, uh, certainty? We need certainty as a basic, and that's fundamental, for settling disputes. It is not for intellectual satisfaction, nor for accuracy of prediction for its own sake but for forensic and political reasons. Well, that's uh, absolutely central. And she says, it's, the problem is not knowledge, but agreement. And here is the link with sophism, Lacan, because the sophist is the guy who's trying to make a consensus, regardless of the, of the, of the notion of, of knowledge, certainty, and truth. What you, need, what you, what you want is consensus. An internal contradiction, but there is an internal contradiction which threat, in which a threat of tyranny lies hidden for, for democracy. Why? Because there is a contradiction between democracy and dogmatism. In liberal democracy, certain, certainty has a sinister, sinister aspect. It needs authority to back interpretation and control dissent. Then, she says, the threat which manifests itself by the rise of uncertainty is linked to a deep social mutation. If we recognize more uncertainty now, it will be because of things that have happened to the, and I quote, institutional underpinning of our beliefs. And that is what we ought to be studying. And that is what I'm going, I'm going to, to study, to, to, to show how it's possible to study that. Now, uh, if we go back to, to, to what Marie Douglas says, there is an enigma. Certainty, because there is an, the, the, the enigma is the following. First, she separates empirical and dogmatical. And I think very interesting from the point of view of what I've heard in the discussion, many of, of what I've heard about phenomenology is about empirical uh, phenomenology, feeling, emotion, uh, and so on. Not dogmatic uh, uh, phenomenology in a way. And, and so there is this dogmatic institution and you have the empirical, the mood and the feeling. And, and, in, and, and this, the idea is that the feeling of uncertainty comes only late. So this is an enigma. What happened before? Of course there was some feeling, but it was not general. 
Why is there now a general feeling of uncertainty? Well, because there is a crisis of institutions. Because, and it is this crisis that makes that the notion of institutions become a topic of, of, uh, of re a relevant topic from a theoretical point of view. And, the, and it's linked to this crisis and the threat to our society because without dogma, there is no society, say Tocqueville. Now, uh, I found in literature that uh, somebody said something wrong, <laughs> something nasty about Tarkov Parsons. I know uh, he has been a tyrant of, of, of uh, uh, the American sociological departments for, for many years. Uh, and James Coleman in 1990, uh, wrote a comment on an article by Talcott Parsons in 1934, uh, an article that he republished at that time. And the, the title was, of this article, Prolegomena to a Theory of Institution. And, and Coleman says, strangely enough, uh, Talcott Parsons since then has not developed this theory and nobody has developed it. So again, you see a long time where the notion of institution is forgotten is a theory of institution. And, um, and he says, maybe now we should deal with it. So it's like, like Marie Dugas. Now the question of institution may become important and, and we, we, are we have to be confronted with the fact that the dogma is not anymore certain. So, and if we go back to the article by Parsons, he, he, he didn't develop, by the way, Coleman says he didn't develop for two reasons. He wanted to avoid conflict and the notion of conflict, and he and he had a, an idea of harmony as a basis of society, especially cultural harmony. So this, this impeded him from dealing with the notion of of a theory of institution. But but in, if you read the text by Parson, it's not a bad text because he says there are two meanings to institution. On one side, it's an analytic category, which is a theory of institution. On the other side, it's a class of a concrete phenomenon which you study, you teach, and, 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 and so on, which are empirical. On one side, there is a subjective nature which is beyond the visible. On the other side, is, there is an objective nature of visible institution. On one side, there is a transcendental end, the salvation, nirvana, and which is uh, basic. But, but on the other side, it's empirical ends, what you want, what you wish. What you, uh, what you are looking for. On one side, you have a shared system of superior value. On the other side, you have random individual variation, multiplication of potential conflict. So you see, um, so now that we know what we are, why in a way uh, there is a, what is the nature of the crisis, which is a crisis of institution. And suddenly um, the question is how can we study uh, this change in dogmatic, in the dogmatic fabric of society. So we shall see first the nature of dogmatic ideas, see what is visible and invisible among them, and then look at the history, crisis, and periodization. So this is the central, this is the basic idea, the notion of system of legitimacy. The dogmatic ideas you require is a system of legitimacy, in, in, I call it a system of legitimacy, implies the existence of a system of shared symbol, that first must be very simple, formal, so that it can be easily shared by all. Two, it must allow to code reality, to describe it in such a way that it allows to product judgment about who is right and who is wrong that can be opposed to third parties. Third, which is such that conforming to the rule of its syntax imply a promise of well-being, of justice, of success, of salvation. Four, must be sufficiently different from reality to be compatible with life. Because theory, people always say theory is too simple, life is complex, but it, but it is the quality of the theory to be simple so that you, life can be free. You, know? you have to obey some, some, some formal rules which are extremely strict, but of course, everybody knows that life is different. So if it's, it has to be different from reality, the norm is not the fact. Uh, norms are not the fact. Otherwise, you don't. You would not need norms. Um, and so, so it, they have to be different from reality to be compatible with life, its variety, its mobility. But on the other side, it must be sufficiently similar to reality so that to appear 
to be an acceptable representation of this reality. And then is what happens is below this minimum required level of resemblance or recognition, uh, Yankelevich would say, je ne sais quoi, or presque rien, I don't know what, or nearly nothing. There is a crisis of legitimacy. At some point, people realize that it's impossible that this system of symbol be a correct representation of, of the world. Let's say when you have a uh, big trust at the end of the 19th century, people cannot believe anymore that they are in a free market with atomistic enterprise. I mean, it's clear enough, I think. And I call that, so it goes back to the notion of phenomenology, this system is a normative phenomenology of common sense. Which, what does that mean? It means it's, it doesn't tell you what people see. It tells you what people should see, given they belong to a given community. Now, uh, you see that it's built like that. You have symbols, you have legal aspect, you have an epistemological aspect, and then you have the aesthetics criteria. Now, the question, the comparative approach, how do you compare? To, have, uh, to, have a, to, the, to compare, you need to have a theory of these dogmatic uh, symbols, general theory that you can generalize for all the Western countries, let's say. And the, and the minimum, given it has to be simple, the minimum system has to be two principles. One, which I will call the metaphysical principle, and the other one, the anthropological principle. The metaphysical principle is formal, explicit, and is linked to something which is not visible. Basically, nature, God, and so on. These are metaphysical notions. The anthropological principle is exactly the reverse. It's informal, it's implicit, it's taboo. You should not even discuss it, but it is obvious to all. So what, is, what does that mean? It means that if you want to, to solve a conflict, you need first to have a conflict to share. We, you need an anthropological principle that tells you what you have as a common experience. People of the same society share the same view, general view of the world. So they view that, but they don't discuss it. Because if they started to discuss this, uh, this uh, pre, pre, precondition of their conflict, uh, they will never have a conflict. They will never start. So you, the society is based on this pragmatic anthropological principle that is obvious to everybody, but nobody knows in a way explicitly and discussing explicitly. And you have the metaphysical principle, which allows, once you have a, an event, to say whether it's a good, the action that was good or bad. Uh, now, the, 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 the second aspect is you, institution requires stability. But the Western world is based on three essentially dynamic processes. Enterprise, which is to do what is not done, or has not been done. Uh, science, which is to change the limits of knowledge. And technology, which is to change the limit of the possible. Uh, given that you need the, the, the institution to be fixed, and given that be, be, below reality is extremely dynamic, dynamic as, as long as it is possible to keep the same symbols, you will keep them. But after a, a while, it becomes impossible and you have a crisis. That is why this history is with a periodization. There is a periodization of history because there is this contradiction between dynamism and stability. Now you see, with time, let's say, if that is a metaphysical principle, these are the action and it's like a correlation line uh, as long as you, it's so precious to have a metaphysical principle that as long as it is possible to argue that these, these are just representation, it's a good representation of the action, you will keep it. But after a while, it's not possible. So you get a crisis. And, and there are two types of crisis. On one side, if you can re reorganize your metaphysical principle without thematizing the anthropological principle, you have what I call a crisis within the system of legitimacy. But if, but then if you go on, it gets to a point where it's impossible to reshuffle, to reorganize an uh, a metaphysical principle without thematizing the anthropological principle. And that is a crisis of the system because you, you have a breakdown of all the uh, dogmatic uh, elements, which was the link of society. Now, I want to, to show rapidly a, comp a possible comparison. If you take United, uh, uh, 
UK, uh, USA, and France, they all had a revolution at different times, but in modernity starts with the revolution. And they have very different types of attitude. Here you see it's Weberian, of course, my approach is Weberian, charisma, tradition, and reason. Now, the France has got rid of charisma and of tradition and kept reason. Um, UK has got rid of charisma with Charles I, but kept tradition and reason. USA have got rid of tradition when they cut with England, but they have kept uh, charisma and, 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 and uh, reason. So you see that the metaphysical principle is rational and, and it is the same for all of them. And that's why you have the same three periods in all these country when you look at the, at the history of the symbolic system. But there are different, uh, the invisible dimension, uh, the, uh, there is another dimension, which is the anthropological dimension, which is, so you have the visible and the invisible, and it accounts for the difference. So you have tradition, which is underlying UK, charisma, which is underlying uh, USA. And what about France? Well, France has to use reason at two, at two levels. That's, that's the Cartesian <laughs> aspect of it. Now, to show that it's not only theory, I just want to show the iconography of banknotes in 19th century. And you will see that uh, in none of these countries, once in the whole century, and uh, there is never a face of somebody with a name in France and in England, never. Once in England, an accident that I don't have time to expose, once, many in America, most tickets have people there with their name. It can be le a general lieutenant of, of, a, of a state, a governor, whatever. So you see, and in England, you see the, the castle, you have armories and things like that. So I, I think, and here, what you have, you have the Karyatid, you have the Greek thing, which is what Kant says from point of view aesthetics, the line and not the color, and then the classics as, as a model of aesthetics. So you see, they use reason to define the iconography. Now, the, I, I, if we take France now, I will go France and America rapidly. The, the system develops like that. You have the level of, of, uh, of science, let's say physics, nature, culture, and you have the science of nature. Then you, it develops, the, you, you project on culture the same type of, of scientific thinking and so you have laws of culture constructed according to the model of science of nature. Then you have law, which is legal system, which is private, where the laws of nature, and public, where you need the culture needed to govern that. I mean, you can, uh, and then administration. This can, may seem very ab uh, arbitrary or very, uh, uh, you know, uh, so I just, to prove that that's not the case, uh, if you take the Bible, you see that it corresponds to the four first uh, book of the Pentateuch. First the cosmos, then the people, then the Levitic, the Leviticus, and then numbers. And so the, the very, and of course you see that this is the invisible and the Leviticus is a ritual, which is a visible. And I think that is the most important thing, interesting thing in this, in this uh, slide to show that law for us is a ritual, which means it is, uh, uh, actions opposed, which can be opposed to third parties that can be witnessed, which are concrete, which are which you can see, and which establish your subordination to invisible powers, which are above, in the sciences and so on, and of course now with numbers, which is management. Uh, as you see uh, now, the history of, uh, of course, the history is a history of law, and this is a. Uh, 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 dogmatic history because ignorance of the law is no excuse. So the, 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 if there is a history of the legal norm, it is uh, uh, an official uh, law, history, uh, in a way, a compulsory history. In France, it is linked to the, to the criterion of administrative law, which separates the private from the public, three periods. I go very fast because I don't have much time. And you can see that the first one is origin of power, finality of power, and crisis of the criterion, which is what the what the government says and what the law says, which is crisis of legitimacy, crisis of the limit, 
and now you have the methods of power. And you see, here you have certainty, here you have certainty, and now you have uncertainty. There's crisis of legitimacy linked to uncertainty, goes back to what we've seen. Now, if I want to, this, now if I want to look at the epistemological dimension, you can define an action phenomenologically as an action in appearance in as much as it is referred to a cause. And if you define an action like that, there are only three ways to legitimize it. By the cause, and that's transcendentalism. By the finality, the change in appearance, if you consider there is a consensus of measurement, so you can measure for finality, this is positivism. And a change in appearance without con a priori consensus, that's radical pragmatism. And that is the science of the artificial because of complete confusion of nature and culture. So you see it's pragmatism, no communism, some, some pragmatism, radical pragmatism, confusion, nature and culture, no, uh, no, uh, uh, Newton says, I do not, uh, hypothesis non fingo, and so on. Uh, here you have uh, some, uh, some uh, artifact because uh, Kant says that mathematics are, you, are, are, are useful, uh, uh, more interesting, as, uh, more important as being useful than uh, in all the sciences than for their own results. And, uh, and then, of course, a complete confusion, which is the artificial. And, and opinion. The role of opinion in none, because everybody has the access to the transcendental aesthetic of Kant. Some role of opinion, because given you have several sciences, everybody does not have the same access to science. Consequently, you, you, some people have opinion, others have knowledge. And, and then you have uh, opinion everywhere, which is the last thing. And of course, when you have opinion and, and artificial, it makes rhetoric. So rhetoric is no rhetoric, some rhetoric, and every which is pedagogy, by the way, and 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 rhetoric everywhere, which is sophism, the, uh, and marketing, if you like. Um, now I, I'm annoyed by this. So I have to put it here somewhere. So if I if, if I just want to show you that the, the, you see the problem, there is an enigma, which is how come that the crisis in legal terms is, is in 1945, 1960, legal crisis, and that the feeling of uncertainty according to Marie de Grasse is around 1990, 1995. What happened in between? Well, in between you have a, a repression, a denegation of the crisis because it's unbearable. So how, you do, how do you manage? What the basis of certainty in science, in Kant and in Kant, is the protection of the immediate data of consciousness, which is logic, psychology, and language. They are not to be discussed. They are completely outside. Um, they, so, so I don't want to go, but you can show it each time. It's explicitly excluded from epistemology. No logic, no psychology. By the way, Kant say the, it's a mani uh, maniac um, of sophists which have this, this idea of psychology and, and uh, exclude language. Now you see that to survive, the, 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 there, is a, there is an effort to reconstruct uh, an epistemology on logic and psychology, keeping language aside. These are the neo position. And after a while, you cannot anymore avoid language and you have quasi position. And after a while, you, this quasi position don't, don't look very good, and it becomes pseudo position, which is very like fictitious. Fic, fictitious. Now you see, uh, I, I do. So if if you look at that, the neo position, neo transcendentalist is Russell, philosophy as a rigorous science. Positivist is science of system, science of the artificial. These are neo positivist, quasi transcendent, quasi transcendentalist Jacques Derrida. The Architecture, Grammatology. Quasi positivist is Michel Foucault with a description of dispositif. Then you have the linguistic turn and you go to pseudo and you have pseudo transcendentalist, Jean Francois Lyotard, with the end of great uh, grand récit and the introduction of small récit. And you, in, I think, in, in uh, pseudo positivist, you have Gilles Deleuze with this con with construction of concepts and resume and so on. And this is French theory, by the way. So I just want to say, if I one minute to show you one thing, I will, it's about America. You see, the problem is how this system, how is it possible to reconcile the top-down logic of the kernel of legitimacy with the bottom-up logic of American institution? 
which starts with we the people? Well, I think that it starts like that. Um, you, before philosophy, <laughs> you have, of course, a lot of religions and people are, as you say, Puritans and so on. Here, I, what I have here are awakenings. The crisis of legitimacy in America are linked to, because the big, the, the split is not between public and private. It is between the sacred and the profane. And the, uh, the crisis expressed most, imp in, most importantly in awakenings. This is the awakening of the, of the, uh, of the uh, 18th century. The, and then what happens here? How does it work? It works that uh, here you have people in the church uh, that are saved. They look for the salvation and they are holistic. Uh, uh, I would say America is a collective society of churches, of, 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 of boroughs, of, of uh, association, we would say, and so on, all kinds of collective things at a private level. But, but they send to the uh, pro uh, profane world individuals who are public. I say, strangely enough, the, the individualism is public. And, and they try to fight with, uh, with this wild world. Uh, uh, and they come back at night and they uh, purify themselves in the, in the church. And that is the way it works between, between the world of perdition that you need to, to, to live with and the, the world of salvation, which allows to go on. Uh, but then uh, at some point, uh, some philosophy, so you have a, you have a, a new, um, a new uh, awakening and you have people coming out from religion or to, why being religious, uh, uh, being theologian like Henry James Sr. or, or a former priest and former pre, uh, like Emerson. And they, 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 they will, they, I, I cannot say much, but in terms of exchange, they import mysticism. They require the, what is required to, to, to reinforce their position is mysticism. Uh, strangely enough, Henry James imports Swedenborg. Swedenborg, he's the man that Emmanuel Kant uh, fought against. Eh? So you see that it, it is transcendentalist on both sides, on, on the side of Swedenborg and on the side of Kant. And uh, Emerson probably imports Schelling via Coleridge, great man. And, and, and there is, because you, you, there is this requirement. Okay, this is one step. Then what happens? What happens is that the, the, uh, it, you go from here, there is a crisis. There is a, uh, there is a crisis, there is an awakening. Now there is a discussion about the world of separation, which is not anymore the sacred, but the world of separation and the, um, and the, uh, uh, melting pot, which which is here. The, I, I'm, I don't have time to discuss, but the wall of separation is a 20 years fight to try to have a vote for the separation of, of the state and and and, and uh, state and government and so on, and doesn't work. But the uh, I think Supreme Court interpret sentence by Jefferson as meaning that there is a wall of separation. Then there is, but then what happens? Given the what happens? What happens precisely is that the firm is getting so big that it cannot enter the church anymore. So, if the church, if the if the firm cannot enter the church, it cannot be purified by religion. So, you need to have a, a legitimate, a, a rational legitimacy. So, there is a demand for theory in economics and a fight on this. So, you have institutionalism, agrarian populism and the demand for theory, and it's all that is a crisis in this year. And of course, if you want to have a, a theory, an you need an epistemology, and if you have an epistemology, you need to have a philosophy. And, and, and the, in, the, 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 the intensity of the activity of philosophy at the end of the 19th century is huge. I would say bigger than in France, because you have all this importation of idealism and so And there is this very interesting guy named Santayana, but I don't have much time to to, to go too much into it. And then you have the uh, uh, very, or the, the um, sorry, uh, you have the original, I'm sorry, this is annoying. Uh, you, you have this, you, there you have the second period here, you have pragmatism, 
which in a way it's, it's, a, it's a form of transcendentalism because they are all very much linked to God. And, and, to, uh, and then you, and here you have all kinds of discussion linked between James and Durkheim. There is a book of fight between them, which is very interesting. And uh, of course there are links which are more positive with Bergson. Then you have in economic theory, you have the, the, Chicago, the first Chicago school, Frank Knight, I cannot talk too much about him, but all this does not work so much. So after the year 27, C.I. Lewis is the last pragmatist uh, and, and the power goes to analytic philosophy and yet they come from Austria. And I think they come from Austria because they have a, they have a dogmatic uh, principle that they can import with themselves uh, and uh, that we can discuss, but uh, it, they come with their dogmatic and of course, you import the guy uh, and you pretend you don't know they are coming with a pragmatic thing. I, uh, to tell you what it is, uh, for instance, Hayek in his, uh, his noble speech uh, say there are two forerunners of economics in the 16th century Spain, and they are two Jesuits. Austria is an empire, uh, is an Asburg, Asburg, huh? and, and the whole this Vienna circle and so on, he belongs to this space. Now I want to finish. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I know it's too late. So the Roman, I, I'll just interject to say my my timer says you are at exactly yes, forty five minutes I since I will you finish. started. I finish it. I but, I, uh, agree. I stop. I just say according one thing. According to the hypothesis, what we should find in the third period is neo quasi pseudo pragmatist and we have them, or quasi-positivist implying confusion between the nature and culture, analytic and synthetic fact and value and so on. On the side of anthropological principle, an explicit reference to community, which is like Walzer or uh, Afro-American studies, women's studies, wokeism and so on, all these things are perfectly logical as a, as a crisis linked to the presence of the anthropological, which is a communitarian. communitarian and linguistic turn all over the place. I, and and uh, I'll, I'll finish it by that. The, the motto of the, the nation goes from e pluribus unum to in God we trust. The confusion between church and state. That's it. Thank you very much, uh, Roman, for that. Uh, that uh, I, I would say from my perspective, very insightful, uh, expansive, and then also uh, ultimately troubling or vexing uh, talk. Um, I'll invite uh, comments in the chat, or if you would, Roman, maybe stop sharing your screen. Yes. Um, it'll allow me to see others raising yeah. either their wait, little wait. fake. Well, well, uh, again, just I think share screen. There we are. So I can see folks, their actual hands or Sorry. their Zoom hands. Um, I'll uh, lead in with why I'm troubled or vexed while others uh, gather their wits in response. Um, and that is just to say that this semester, this spring, I taught my uh, seminar in economic inequality uh, that I had uh, not taught uh, for a year or so. And when you talk about um, the, the prophecy, the uh, return of aristocracy as industrial aristocracy, um, it would seem to me that that's a fairly, uh, again, that's what's troubling or vexing to me to think that, you know, Elon Musk is the man of the year uh, in Time magazine. Um, the, 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 the wealth that has been assembled and accumulated by those extremely wealthy, particularly during the time of the pandemic when so many have suffered uh, both uh, economically and, and in terms of their physical and health and vitality. Um, are we, have we arrived, it's an empirical question to you maybe, uh, have we now arrived uh, at a moment where the industrial aristocracy has returned? And if so, or if not, what would be the method, the dogmatic ideas, the visible and invisible elements uh, of history, history and crisis that would allow us to make that judgment? What, what's, what's your... It's a softball pitch, Roman. Are, are we living in industrial aristocracy in, in the US today? What, what, what's your thought on that? I would say yes, but I would say that if you look at chapter 20, just of this, which is the last of the second book of Tocqueville, the title is that aristocracy may be engendered by manufacturers. 
And this chapter is, I, I wrote a book around that, which mm. is called uh, Tocqueville uh, in the Land of Man. And, 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 uh, and it's, it's 10 pages, five, five pages. And, and, and he speaks about division of labor and, and about uh, uh, economies of scale and about the people, uh, clever people who, who get money and others who, who become more like machines. It's incredible text. Uh, and of course, we are in, a, in an oligopo in, a, in an oligarchy, uh, very much so. I mean, it, it's, that's, I mean, that seems obvious. Uh, that it, uh, there is a let's say there is a big, a big and bigger uh, dimension of agriculture. This is exactly what Tocqueville says. Mm. Uh, mm. Because and um, of course, uh, the, no, I mean there is some truth to what he to, to, to what he describes. Uh, again, I'm happy to be right, but uh, sad to be right about that. Um, Pierre, I see your your hand up. Uh, let's hear hear from you, please. Well, uh, thanks a lot, Romain, for your your uh, expose of your whole uh, philosophy, in a sense. But uh, so the ba the basis of all uh, the philosophical developments in uh, the U.S. or in the Europe and the differences between them can be derived from a crisis and a crisis of legitimacy. No. And so the oh, oh no no no. There is a crisis on both sides. Mm -hmm. But and, the, cri the, the crisis, crisis is, is a driving, the is a driving. Yeah. The, the, the crisis is, is in each country has its own crisis. Mm -hmm. And each country to survive has to borrow from, from another country. Uh, so so the, the exchanges in philosophy are just, uh, I, I, I would say, the Lego required to build the system of legitimacy of each country. That's why they use Swedenborg, you know, from Sweden. People don't study Swedenborg. And it's extremely interesting. I have the book by of Arne James Sr. on Swedenborg. He was Swedenborgian. And by the way, the first pages, it's Kant, Kant, Kant. And, and well, the, the, another example, why France should have Kant? The, 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 it's very strange. We are French. We have Descartes. But I, I can show you a book. Uh, uh, um, I have the copy there, uh, uh, even the image uh, about, which is called From Königsberg to Paris, uh, the reception of Kant in Paris between uh, 1780 and, and 1804. During the French Revolution, it was required. We need, why? Because you don't do a democratic system with Descartes, because Descartes requires the guarantee of a god. And Kant was the one who could uh, speak about religion within the limits of reason. Now, the question is why can they do it and why can't we? Because the, the, I think the dogmatic principle, the anthropological principle of France is Cartesian, whereas the anthropological principle of Germany is Geist, the notion of Geist, which means something which is both individual and collective, which allows to understand what is transcendental aesthetics. The, the, they, they have a principle that you're allowed to say, we all see time and space in the same manner. We, of course, you could say empirically we can see, but it's not enough. If you want it to be dogmatic, you need to have this dogmatic element, which is there is a geist, which is shared by everybody. And by the way, da, uh, Derrida wrote a book about the notion of geist in Heidegger, that's where I found the proof that Geist was the principle, because he says that the Geist, Heidegger says, we should not talk about Geist. And, 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 and then he does talk it with, with between, uh, 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 <clears throat> you know, the uh, Guillemet, uh, and, and, and it, it tricks to, to speak about them. This contradiction, and of course, why does he do it? Because there is a crisis. So he can talk about it. I, you say you say there is a, there is a convergence between between I mean the the title of the workshop being America and Europe is that converge I mean during the period of Hunter's Hunter's period 1920 to 1970 we see a big convergence that many of us are working in institutions that were sort of favoring that convergence for instance i'm thinking of uh, uh, francois xavier in dauphine and and 
and uh, these schools that were put up as the Defi Americain and the way of the social <laughs> science. The American, it, are we going on with this conversion or are we in, in, a, in a period when it splits up? Is there another crisis coming that sort of will split no, I, up this conversion? No. I think the crisis in which we are, I think we are in the follow-up of this. I, I was sent in the States to, to, uh, by this movement. Uh, you, you were part of the, uh, of the of post martial movement as many uh, of the academics. It was not Marshall, it was a, the Fondation Nationale pour l'Enseignement de la Gestion. Yeah, it which was, was the French mm, government in 68. Which Ford was, Foundation, etc. Mm, no, mm. not Ford Foundation. Fondation Nationale pour l'Enseignement de la Gestion. It was Michel Debré. Who was oh, yeah. Sending, oh, yeah. uh, no no not at all. Mm -hmm. That's, mm -hmm. Ford Foundation was it before. The, the, uh, it was it was Michel Debré, uh, the most sovereignist of the French uh, uh, ministers, who, who who founded this mm -hmm. to import uh, management teaching. So, mm -hmm. but this was one in in the sixties and so on. There was an importation of that. The, it happened that since, if you like, the crisis as you as I have shown starts illegally in the sixties. In, by the way, in America, uh, in God We Trust is 54. Huh? It, it, it's uh, the it's the the you you have you have all kind of things which show that this is the problem, uh, where, and but there is a denegation. There is a, a time where you have uh, system analysis, for instance, is is quasi is a neo positive is a quasi positivist. They do with circle and, and arrows as if it was closed system. And it, it worked for a while. And by the way, it worked for a while for, for a very simple reason. As long as you have a two-tier market, half of it with, without feedback and half of it with feedback, the guy who has a feedback has an advantage. And its population grows and grows and grows. And when everybody has a feedback, there is instability. So you can understand why in the 60s, you, for instance, in uh, information processing, IBM and so on, you, you could not imagine that they could have problem because with respect to mechanography, they were superior. So as long as you had a lot of mechanography, they could replace this mechanography with these feedback machines called computers. But once everybody has computers, everybody has this ability, the, the instability becomes a rule of the system. So, so, uh, so it's an evolution and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and the uh, deepening of this. And of course, uh, on, on many, on many and, uh, I mean, the, the, this crisis develops and, and, this, and you can see it in the, in the, in the American philosophy. Uh, I, 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 French, I, I, I read recently about Davidson and Donald Davidson. And strangely enough, when I was in, in Cornell, I, I got a book called Supers and Davidson, about, which was about decision theory. Now you see the history of, of the thinking of Davidson about, it's, it's incredible. And, and, and they are trying to have a science of decision. This doesn't work. And if you have a management without the science of decision, then it's haphazard. And then you are in, you are, and you have a, a uncertainty and, and chaos. And of, Roman. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I jump in uh, on behalf of uh, one of us who uh, can't talk now because of a sleeping child, uh, but who comments in the chat. Uh, this is Sylvain Colombero. Uh, what a challenging talk. Sorry, I can't talk because of the daughter sleeping. Uh, but in regards to what you've mentioned about institutions, the question is, has neo-institutionalism theory a future? And if yes, what could it be? According to you, what could be the roots of neo-institutionalism then? Well, the most striking things about neo-institutionalism is that you, you don't find any text, I don't think, where they, where they speak about the history between institutionalism and neo-institutionalism. <laughs> so, so, so this denegation of the history show already that they don't have a theory of institution. Even, even uh, I, there is one which is very good, which is Scott, from, from which I like very much with the three pillars and so on. But the, you see the problem with institution is that you cannot have a theory of institution for a very simple reason, which is, which is dogmatic and theoretical. Institution in th are the first taken for granted. You were speaking about imminent. They are taken for granted. They have to be taken for granted. If you make a theory, you have to contemplate them and to, to, to put them at a distance, to be able to think, to criticize them. So you break down. So, it's a, so actually the neo-institutionalism was a try 
to, re, to, to deal with institution like the institutionalists did at the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century, uh, which is, uh, and, and it's very interesting, very and, and, and they speak about legitimacy and so on, but they don't have, I don't think they have a real, they, because to have a theory of institution, you have to accept uncertainty. And, and, and basically, I don't think they do. And the notion of uncertainty, by the way, is uh, we published in a French review, it's going to be translated, it is translated and it will be published in English, uh, a special issue on Frank Knight. I don't know whether you know Frank Knight, but Frank Knight was one of the founder of Chicago School of Economics. And uh, he wrote a book called Risk, Uncertainty and Profit, which is the first book which dealt with uncertainty. And strangely enough, economists, economists don't know him, usually don't know him, and uh, we, we, for for sorry, so we have it was centennial uh, of, of this book, so we did a special issue. So the the ignorance of Frank Knight is a very good measure of the impossibility of the difficulty of having a, a straight look at institutions. So institutionalists did a wonderful work, but they but they avoided the ver the real question of what are institutions. They deal in, of institution like Parson says, categorizing them, but never going to the transcendental, invisible underpinning of our being. Thank you, Roman, for that. There's uh, a couple of comments in the chat. Maybe we can cut and paste those onto the shared note board uh, at some point. I think with that, though, our time for this aspect of the program is now to an end. Uh, next. What happens is we split into two parallel tracks. Uh, those of you who've been with us all day know how it works. Those of you who may just be arriving, go back to the, the, the program and click on one link uh, to access track three. Uh, you'll see me there um, and or access track four uh, and you'll see other friendly faces um, there. Roman, thank you so very much thank for you. this uh, important and challenging talk. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you all. Just a quick note, like the link for the track four has changed. So I've just sent you an email and it's also in the chat. So if you want to connect to track four to learn more about uh, Lucy and I work, uh, we'll be in track four and we have presentation on track three from uh, Matt and from Francois Xavier. So on track four, we'll just have one presentation and then we convene on track three. So you have that information in the, in the chat. Thank you again for listening. <laughs>